Thank you for watching, liking, commenting, sharing, and subscribing right now. To get, well, I have an iPhone. Will that set off the noise? Okay, because I, you know, I know it's a tech conference and everything, so, and I know everybody loves their phones, but, you know, I feel like if I'm going to be up on stage, I'm not trying to be an asshole and everything, but if I'm going to spend my time and share with you guys and everything, I just want your attention up here fully, and I think everybody next to you, so please, turn your phones on, um, <laughs> if you could, really, because I... Just, I'm just trying, not, not trying to be a jerk, but if you could turn them on, and if you've got a volume control, if you could make sure it's up all the way. <laughs> as loud as you can possibly put it. Because otherwise, it's gonna screw up my presentation later on. So, this is how we used to get our information, at least I did when I was a kid. Um, she didn't look like that, and in fact, I have a lot of good friends who are librarians, and they would be really, really angry with me if they saw I was using the stereotypical slide. They would tell you that librarians are very high-tech, very savvy, and they don't have glasses that hang around their necks. They have LASIKs, so it's all right. Uh, but really, I mean, how many of you remember when you needed to find something, you went to a library and asked a librarian? Anybody like that, right, you know? Or you would ask your friends or family, or there were these things called an encyclopedia. They were like Wikipedia, but everybody didn't write them. And um, they didn't come number one on Google because we didn't have Google. So, you know, you've heard information revolution. And I think that what we've been going through over this past 10 years has been very, very significant. This will be Google's 10-year birthday and next month. Um, and even before Google, we had search engines. I know it's hard to believe. But we're going through an information retrieval revolution. And that I just, I think the change is really underestimated. Now, I live and breathe and love search, so maybe it's just, I feel like it needs to get a lot more credit than it does. But it's so dramatically changed the way that we operate, and I don't even think that sometimes we think about it. Um, it really struck home with me when I was writing, and in 2000, there was this consumer daily question study that was conducted. I said turn them on, I didn't say talk, no. <laughs> um, they, what they did, a, a company called Keen, they had 74 people, they gave them tape recorders, and they said, spend a week, and every time you've got a question that comes up, I want you to go through and like, write down or say to the tape recorder how you got your answer, what did you do? And search engines were the top resource. Um, a lot of numbers here, you won't, well, maybe you can see some of them, but there it was like, you could answer more than one option, right? That's why they won't add to 100. But internet search engines, like a third of the people roughly said that, that was the top thing that they did when they needed an answer. This was in 2000. Google was maybe a year and a half old. Um, we had had search engines only really since 94, 95, six years at best. And in six years, they have become our top way we get information. I, I was just stunned. I, I couldn't wait. I mean, the, the library and yellow pages, you know, like middle of the pack. Nobody bothered. It just really was a huge, huge revolutionary thing to me. And today, this is from the Pew Internet study. I'll put all these slides up on SlideShare. Um, if you follow me on Twitter, it's Danny Sullivan. I'll Twitter the URL out there, because um, I couldn't get it before I came up. But this is a study that was just recently done. 58% of the people say that when they needed an answer to something, they used the Internet, or they turned to professionals for some special th like things, friends and family. And, you know, there's library down there in 13%. Now, we just Google it. It's that we, we depend on the web for everything. So quick interactive question time. And I need you to record your gut reaction when I show you this question. Just, I'm going to need an answer to the Edgewater Hotel. It's right next door. I need to get that number. Now, I'm going to ask you how to get it, and I need your gut reaction. How many of you thought, search a Google for it, right? Search for Google for it. How many of you thought, I'll call 411, right? <laughs> What do, you, what, do you think would be, what do you think would be the fact? What's 411? Well, yeah, you call Google 411. Hello, my number is. <laughs> Larry and Sergey would like to thank you for calling and helping us with our voice recognition technology. Anybody think about opening the yellow pages? Yellow pages? What? So, I mean, there, I've, I've done classes on searching where, you know, I've tried to teach people how to search, and I've gone through the phone number thing before, and I've watched them spend, like, five minutes trying to find the telephone number. I'm like, you know, call 411. That, that works. There's even some free services that are out there. I mean, it could be we could do a race later on to see it. But the point is, that's our first resource. At Google, they're like, at the search engines, they're our friends. We can tap into them. So, in 2006, Google was um, providing 
um, some financial guidance, even though they don't do that, to some financial people, even though they don't care about them, because they really do. And in the slides, they had little notes about what they were trying to get across as the Google message. And one of those things was that um, they wanted Google to be as ubiquitous as brushing your teeth, which was kind of weird. I did a panel with teenagers on how they thought about search, and I asked them what they thought. And I thought this other guy had a better example where he said he thinks of Google as like, you know, the public toilets. They're just always there if you need them. Uh, which, <laughs> which we also didn't think was perhaps the best metaphor if you were Google. Um, perhaps Google's like oxygen or search is like oxygen, but it, certainly it is ubiquitous. It, it search is out there all over the place. Another survey recently done, 49% of people say they search every day, do search every day. It's up from 30% in 2006, and it's just behind email, which has been the long time. That's what we do every day. We don't need to email anymore, though, because we have Twitter, so it's all right. And the other huge revolution is not only are we doing it so often, but we're doing it everywhere. You know, when you launch a location app on your iPhone, that is search. It doesn't matter that you didn't put in a keyword and you used Urban Spoon, which is totally awesome, and you just click, 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 and you know, went like that, and you got your restaurant. That was a search. You had a query, you expressed it in a particular way, and you were given an answer to it, what you wanted. Um, GPS services, you know, my, love my GPS because it'll show me where all the Dunkin' Donuts are. So when I drive around California, it says, if you would only drive 3,000 miles to the other side of the country, you could get Dunkin' Donuts, <laughs> which makes me cry. Um, TV search. So I just moved back here from the UK to the US, hurrah, and um, I got direct TV, and like I can program my thing to apparently search for stuff and find things that are making me happy, um, or hopefully making me happy. So we're searching all over the place. We're getting all this information that's out there, and we're getting this collision between our real life and our search life, which you know, I'll try to illustrate more as we go along. Um, the Nazi building is a great one, or the swastika building. Has anybody not heard about this before? This is wonderful. This is a building down in San Diego, and uh, it's the US Navy building, ironically enough. Um, <laughs> and so nobody knew it was built in the shape of a swastika, except you know, maybe somebody who looked at it from the air, and those are probably mostly US Navy pilots who probably didn't take it away or whatever. But then it hits Google Maps, and somebody says, look, there's a swastika building down there. Uh, and the Navy takes so much pressure over this, it spends $600,000 to reshape it. Right? We're going to plant some trees and everything, and we'll close up one of those gaps, and it won't look that way anymore. That's, that's like search slamming into to real life with a cost associated with it as well. You know, who would have looked at that kind of information before? It's not like we didn't have aerial photography for ages. We just didn't have it for free for anybody to tap into. Uh, I love this guy. Um, so, well, this couple. So what happened is they're uh, British, and John decided, Nan decided that it would be really cool if John died, and he did, not really though. Uh, instead, what happened is they went off to Panama and bought a house there uh, with the 500,000 pounds that John got because he was dead. Uh, but then for some reason, the people in Panama decided that they really wanted like a passport or something from John. So he showed up back in England and he said, oh, I fell off my canoe. I don't know what happened, but now I'm back. I don't know where I was. And his wife was like, oh my God, he's back. It's great. Um, and then, <laughs> Uh, a neighbor got suspicious and had heard something about them maybe being in Panama, so did this search. And the, it turns out that the Move to Panama company uh, that gets people to move from Britain to Panama, because it's so much warmer there, uh, used them as an example of, hey, if you <laughs> could only fake your death, um, you can then buy a house and move down here, just make sure that you don't lose your passport afterward. And uh, so, so the police did this, and they said, well, you know, we think you did kind of know he was in, alive, because here's a picture of you last year. So that's, I don't feel too bad about that um, search life, real life collision, but, you know, it probably wouldn't have happened three or four years ago. And Google Street View, um, you know, it's awesome, right? You go online, look, there's Fort Point, in San Francisco, I mean, how oh, great, you set the kids down, take a look at this, you don't even have to get out of the car, just like looking out the window, music going, uh, Fennell Hall in Boston over there, donuts, I like donuts, Randy's Donuts down in uh, LA, it's just awesome, and you know, it's, it's beautiful, how could you not love this, unless you're sunbathing nude, and they drive by with one of their cars, and then maybe it's not so awesome, or perhaps it is. Um, it could be awesome if you like looking at it. It's not so awesome if you get confused and you get into a car accident. 
and then that gets recorded on Google, and what a jerk, look, your car's upside down. And it's even worse if that was like your girlfriend, and you're walking with this guy, and he was the guy with her, and then you get into a fist fight over her. It's not, that's not, and then it gets recorded, and your public humiliation becomes further. And you're so sad because she's broken up with you that <laughs> now you're required to go find other ways to find, because the bicycle in the tent wasn't doing it for you, so. <laughs> Which <laughs> is great. So you go to the adult bookstore, and, um, but you run out of money. Uh, no, you're so depressed you have to do some drug deals, which then again get caught on camera, which makes you even more depressed, plus you're running out of money, so you've got to start breaking into houses <laughs> in order to fund your habit and try to break yourself out of this terrible thing that you've been, and then your house burns down. And you might as well just forget it. So yeah, that's not so cool. Or, yeah, it is cool. It's all right. Um, this, by the way, uh, virtually all of those except the burning house, which I got off Ballywag, came from a post that Chris Silversmith did for us. He's awesome on Street View stuff. Um, so, uh, love hate. You, you've got a town in um, Vancouver Island that loves Google so much, they're wiring everything to it. You're like required to have a Google implant chip that records your whereabouts, and uh, no, not quite that, but you can see all sorts of things about this town. They're embracing Google Maps, and they love it, and they're trying to build tourism through it. And then you've got a Minnesota town that's um, all private property, so they're like, yeah, if you drive one of those street view cars on our streets, um, we'll hit you with bats, or we'll fight you in court, as another couple is doing as well. So you know, do we love street view, or do we hate it? Um, there's a group called Stop Child Predators that's really upset about Street View because they're saying this just enables people to cruise down the streets and pick out children and decide what they want to do, where they want to go with it. And the same day that they talk about that, it's, it's all in this story URL that you can pick up later. Uh, you've got another company called Criminal Searches that say, thank goodness we have Google Maps because we can help protect people. Look, now we're mapping all the sex offenders and you can like go around and click. I mean, there's a couple up here. I was going to invite them in, but that was too creepy for me. So. Um, <laughs> I just thought I'd let them stay sort of away. So, you know, what's the, the balance that we do with this? Um, when Google started in the US, they were um, taking pictures of everybody. And again, to stress, taking pictures and putting information online is a search activity. They're gathering knowledge and putting it out there in a way that you can retrieve it. We've tended to think of searches, you know, I wrote a web page and it ranked or it didn't rank. These are real, this is real life. In the same way, Google is taking books and scanning the books that are out there, um, and other information will be gathered up, things that we're not even anticipating. So do we let anybody say, you know what, that's just really personal. I think that should come off the search engine. That's my house. And do we suddenly see Street View, where it looks like one of those you know, um, magazines you see in the rack if you're in Vegas, where they've got the little stars and all the things. You're going down the street, and blank house, blank house, and you can't look at that. Um, and then if you take it off, this always gets me, it's like people get really upset and they start screaming at Google, the other search engines, how could you list this information? How could you do it? Get it out of there. I've had a number of articles I've written. I've talked to people at school districts that leaked um, the, the school test scores and social security numbers of their students, and they get it out of Google, and it's like, but it's still on the web. People who can still find it in other ways, you still have people running their own private tools that are going out there and gathering, so pulling it off. And by the way, you know, I'm sorry that you, know, you got into that fist fight, but it wasn't public, so maybe you should have kept your public you know, fights private. I don't know. So isn't it fair game that it should be out there? Um, so anyway, I, as we're going through this, and I've got time to talk about it more, I thought it'd be fun to get a little more um, personal. Um, I hope this is where everything's going to go terribly wrong or might go find a fun. But is there anybody who kind of matches this out there that wants to admit to it? I think you might have a car like this. And you've got two Johns who are friends. You're married to Andrea. Are you there? Did you come? And this is really, really embarrassing if you didn't come to my session. Then I'll be really, really sad. Nobody like that? All right. All right. Hang on, because the next one may be able to back me up. Sorry, my, mom, my mom's texting me. I've moved back. She's discovered texting. Now she's like, <laughs> hi, I love you. You never call me. Doing a. Doing a presentation. But I hope you guys don't mind if I make a few calls. I do just call her back. Mom, it's not going very well. The first slide didn't work. Didn't pick up. Hang on, this will be all right. I'm sure it's going to work. It's going to be totally cool. Hello. Seth, hey, excellent. Um, I just had a couple questions. First of all, 
Did that sound like Aaron, your friend, earlier? Does Aaron have a car kind of like that? I don't want to get him in trouble. Did he just not didn't like my presentation? He didn't want to come? Oh, Aaron, you're, oh, never mind. I won't, I won't argue, Aaron. Uh, I see you out there now. Um, I'll, don't worry, I'll make it up to you. I'll buy it, your Amazon wish list. I'll get those things for you that you didn't get. Um, but Aaron, I was just wondering, you, Julie likes Mario Kart? Sorry? She does. Because she, she kicked your ass at it. Or I think she was doing something like that. And Stig, we love the Stig, right? He's, he's awesome. Because um, we, we used to get him live in Britain, and then I came here in BBC America. I'm like, this will be great. And then it's apparently just stuff in the attic or whatever. And uh, the Tillamook Air Museum, I love because I'm from Orange County. We have the big aircraft hangars. Not quite as big as that one out there. And the deck's working out all right. Is it? All right. I hope you're getting some good weather with that. So, all right. Well, I got to go. And, oh, you didn't give me your number. I hope you don't mind me calling you like this. But you got my number now, so you can call me back. Okay. All right. Talk to you later. All right. Um, I just need to make another call real quick. I hope you don't mind. Uh, let's see here. Oh, oh, stop. It's a whole iPhone thing, you know, I'm still kind of getting used to it. I was Windows Mobile, so I'm used to things being a lot harder. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, okay. I have a, like a, a dumb phone that I carry around when I actually need to make phone calls. Oh, no. Yoshi, are you not here? Uh, he checked in. Yoshi checked in, and now I'm getting his voicemail, so... Oh, hang on. Don't hang up. He's giving me his thing. I'll just leave him a message. It's all right. It just take a second. I just, he's got a long voicemail. It's in all the options. Like, why just let me start leaving and do the beep right away? Oh, hey, Yoshi, this is Danny Sullivan over at Gnome Dex. I'm doing a presentation. I wanted to give you a call because I got your number off the web. So I thought that would be all right. Anyway, um, you probably don't need to call me back right now because it's not necessary. I wanted to ask if that was your house that's on screen right now. But I'm pretty sure it is. But anyway, don't worry about it. It's totally cool, and it'll be fine. I'll talk to you later. Bye. All right. So I'll leave that one off there. Um, I was going to call someone else, but he's definitely not checking. Well, we'll just do one more. Come on. Give me a second. I'll leave him a message, too. And then we'll, we'll, we're almost done. So, Thank goodness one of you were out there. Whew. I went, by the way, I just went down the uh, Gnome Dex attendee list. So I didn't, Chris didn't like knock anything out. I, I have no phone call reception, so I'll have to ask later on if this if the new painting in the house has been working out all right. I'm sure it is. It's a nice room. I'm sure it's doing well for attendee number three. Finally, um, Chuck, groom, you out there? Chuck, where are you? Chuck? No, you have to wave your hand if you're out there. Oh, you know, I didn't check if he was there. He got married last week, though, and he's very handsome. <laughs> so I think we owe him some applause. I was going to drop by the house, because I've got the address, and bring him some gifts, because I got his registry. Um, but I thought it'd be kind of too creepy, because he doesn't even really know me. So uh, the, the point of this, I didn't, to, to get the information, I just used Google. I did use the white pages that are out there. Let me tell you, if I were like you know, professionally trying to stalk someone, there are great tools I could use if I wanted to pay a little bit more money. I actually was a bit annoyed, because every time I would find one of these tools off of Google, they told me it was free, and then it wasn't. But don't worry, because I know some people at Google, so if those ads at least don't go away, uh, I'll be really angry. But it, you know, it's a tough thing. That I'll get into some of the other issues, but we have our personal information that we put out there that we sometimes don't think that's out there. And then do you want to take it off? But then it's public in other places, and it's going to be in a database somewhere else. And I, we don't have some of the answers to this sort of stuff. That's part of what I want to go into some of the discussion on it. Um, and then aside from the information we put about ourselves, out on the web, or that our friends put about ourselves. I mean, some people, for example, you know, will protect their updates on Twitter, and then um, their other friends will reference what they said, so then it gets out there. Or your friend takes your feed, and they put it in the blog lines, and they forget the password protected, so now your feed is all out there. Um, or people, it, one thing is, you know, that people just don't start to think anymore about what we're putting up online, and is that an issue? Should I check with somebody and going with it from there? And then it's out there. 
Uh, Google was sued for uh, their YouTube records because um, I want to say Verizon, but it's the other evil V company, Viacom. Um, they, uh, you know, are upset at Google because they have all the copyright infringement, allegedly content that's out on YouTube, and haven't figured out a product model for it yet. Anyway. So as part of the lawsuit, they said, look, we need to have the records of everybody who's ever searched for anything on YouTube. Thank you very much. Um, can you hand that over to us? We'd like to have the IP addresses and the cookies and, oh, the usernames, which was really the most important thing. And the judge, in his infinite wisdom and understanding about the internet, said, yeah. <laughs> said, OK, Google, well, I guess this stuff isn't sensitive, because you just did a blog post on how IP addresses aren't really personally identifiable, so I'll give it over. Oh, and they can have those usernames as well which are really identifiable in a lot of cases. Like my username is, um, wait a minute, oh wait, my username is my name. So if you get uh, all my YouTube viewing records, you'll discover that I've been watching a lot of, um, well, you know, I'm embarrassed to say it, but you know, Mentos thing, yeah, okay. Oh, and I watch my own videos, and there's a lot of things out there that you watch. So suddenly it's gonna become a court record. Oh, but it's all right, because it'll go to the courts, and um, Viacom had promised that it will never be, uh, it'll only be used for court purposes. And the people who will see this data are completely trustworthy. And we don't need to worry about that because nothing ever leaks, right? Yeah. Um, this is really scary to me. And in fact, I was really upset because then they did reach an agreement where they were going to anonymize all the data so that your username would get turned into some, you know, non-username that's matched to you, uh, which isn't a solution at all. Uh, if any of you remember what happened with AOL, they anonymized all that data. But the point is that if I can see generic person unknown secret guy keeps going to Danny Sullivan's own videos all the time, you have a pretty good idea. It's probably me. And oh, look, I've been watching Battlestar Galactica because Hulu's idiotic policy of pulling them down when I couldn't see them made me seek it out in illegal places, allegedly. So I think you're going to have, <laughs> I think you're going to have more lawsuits where people have little civil actions and they're going to be in smaller courts and they're going to say we need to have this information handed over to us and you know here's a whole other threat we hadn't anticipated. We've been worried that the data would leak off from Google or we've been worried that the you know, US government would swoop in in a fight against all that's wrong or whatever in the world and demand it and now we're just going to have you know, Judge Judy demanding Google's records and putting it out on, on TV for our entertainment perhaps. I mean it's not as dramatic as that, but they're issues. Location apps are cool. They're like, they're really, really awesome. And they know your location every time you use them. Uh, and so I don't even know how to tell AT&T that I might want to have them purge my location data or if I could even do that. Goodness knows, I don't know if Apple knows every place I've gone to on my iPhone. I assume they probably do. And I don't know that I have any ability to delete that. What's that? So, so. Sorry, I, I thought you had an answer. Um, I don't know, um, but, but now, you know, I mean, okay, Urban Spoon, they seem nice enough, but maybe they're evil. And maybe somehow all my restaurant choices that I've been making will be tracked me out. No, I don't think they are, but there are probably other people who are evil that are out there. And it's just confusing. Who, uh, find somebody to tell them how to clear their data out on Google. They, they already don't, and you can do it, to some degree, and depending on how you want to argue it. But then when you start talking about all these different people who are tracking all of our search activity in various ways, uh, it's kind of a nightmare if you're really that worried about it. So to kind of come back, we've got more and more information that's being made searchable. It isn't just web pages, it's our houses. Um, more public records will start getting thrown out online where you really won't have to pay, where I really will be able to pull up your date of birth and find it out there because it's a public record or that I will be able to find out your traffic violations without having to like, go to court and actually get it. And that stuff will become accessible to a lot of people. And we've got these issues that we're still struggling with. So do you just say, well, users have to have all the control and the users just can wipe out all the data that they want, either their own records, or if they see something out on Google, they can say, take it out, I demand it, and I can prove it. And you have some, some abilities to do this if you can really show that it's very, very personal, and in particular, if you can get the website itself to kind of take it down. But um, as I said, then you have the arguments of, well, if I, pull it off on, if I pull it out of Google and it's still online, what is that really changing? And maybe there's an argument that, well, it's just making it less accessible. You know, I, we know it's not a perfect solution, but maybe people should have that right. I, and I'm not saying that they, that's the way to go. I'm just saying that's one argument that you can make with it. Um, it's just another 
tangential thing to throw out there in terms of how weird things are going when search and real life collide. You know, Google finds itself having to come up with a policy on, you know, what, what to label a body of water that's being disputed between two or three different countries. I mean, you, you can't really picture Larry and Sergey sitting around playing with Legos in 1998 going, oh yeah, and by the way, what's the policy on what we're going to call that body of water between Iran and Iraq? Is it the Persian Gulf or is it the Iranian Gulf? Or, you know, well, let's figure that one out. It's just weird what an impact that it's made. Do we have to do a lot more of educating people about what they do online? I, um, again, to go back to this panel I did at our own conference, uh, I had these teens that were out there, and it was funny, somebody had asked, should we have a teenage search engine, and they're like, no, we don't need a teenage search engine, we know how to find porn easily enough, um, or whatever we want. They, you know, we didn't need to have something like that. They also were asked, well, but, and they felt comfortable using, say, social networking things, but most of them did agree that a lot of their friends didn't really seem to realize what they were putting out there, that this information that they are merrily uploading uh, really wasn't closed off. And even when they felt like they were closing it off because they only let their friends see it or they're protected, they really don't get that once it's out there in any way, shape, or form, it's potentially going to be out there on the web as a whole. Uh, either because your friend inadvertently did it or your friend's not your friend anymore or there's some kind of a loophole that comes along like that you're not really expecting. Um, and then there's the argument that we just embrace there's no privacy. Just get over it and kind of come along with it. Which I think that there is some privacy and we need to find some answers. Oh, and there's, because I was really in love with that point, I thought I'd put it up there twice. So um, anyway, that's, that's pretty much it. Um, I wanted to leave time to talk, I, and I'm really freaked out on this part because Chris was like, make it all interactive. And I'm like, okay, I don't really know what to do except do, what do you want to talk about? <laughs> and we'll see what kind of your thoughts are coming out of it. I'm really looking forward to seeing what people think of some of the issues that were raised. And we can also call more people if you want. Yeah, I guess whoever, is there someone taking the microphone around? Okay. Hello, um, I have a question from somebody in Chris's chat room. Actually, it's from iBowler. The question is, with the Google search engine being optimized so much over the years, has privacy, such as Googling for phone numbers and personal info, become so dwindled that the government may step in? Also, do you think that privacy has even gone down due to Google, Ask.com, et cetera? Well, interestingly enough, I found the Google phone book system, if you've never seen it, sometimes you can enter in a phone number and it'll come back and it'll show with the listing because the person's already listed in the white pages. And I found that that was not working very well. And I almost felt like it wasn't working well because Google uh, probably doesn't want to get rid of the feature, but probably regrets that they ever had it in the first place. So we'll just like let it kind of collapse and maybe nobody will even remember we still have it. I mean, they actually have to have a service where you can remove yourself from Google. And, but that comes to another example. So if your number did show up because you were listed you know, in the white pages somewhere and it did show up on Google, you can get your number out of Google, but then I can go over to whitepages.com and I still get your telephone number. So it, it's part of that same solution. It, the guy, I don't think the government has to come in and regulate Google to say you should be putting phone numbers out there because that's already starting back when you gave the number in the first place. But I don't know if perhaps it's a case that when you get, because I've just had to go through this process of getting a new phone number in the U.S. for the first time in years, and they're like, do you want to be listed? They didn't say, do you want to be listed? Because when we get your number, then not only are you going to be in like a paper book, but you'll probably be out on Google, and you'll be on all these other services as well. Maybe some of that needs to come along. Um, yeah, I think privacy has declined because of the major search engines. Not directly because of them, not because they've gone out and tried to do it. It's just that it's, it's made a lot more information more easily accessible to people who want to learn more about it. Um, bearing in mind that we ourselves have to take a lot of responsibility because we've put a lot of information about ourselves out there, sometimes without thought that everybody might want to have it. That's, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to go through the phone thing, because. I think it's cool in some cases. I put a whole bunch of stuff out there. I could, goodness, thinking that you didn't call me, me. Um, but at the same time, when you see it get flipped around, it can be kind of freaky, and then you can have a whole other attitude in terms of maybe we shouldn't do that sort of stuff or think more fully about it. Oh, and yes? You sort of just brought up my question, which is, you said that you put a lot of personal stuff out there, and I'm curious about where you personally draw the line about the stuff that you put out there, and how much time you spend thinking about um, where your personal information stops. 
I've tended to um, not put a lot about my kids. Uh, I deliberately didn't put out their names. I did a blog post. My blog, my personal blog is at daggle.com, and you can probably find it early enough. But I had this realization that at some point I have to sit my children down and say, you know, a lot of people may think they know a lot about you because daddy writes about stuff. And, um, you know, you're going you're gonna to have to be careful. I mean, it's this whole new world where you're having to say to your children, don't worry about strangers on the street. But by the way, somebody may come along and know that, you know, we went to this place because I Twittered it and that um, I've just bought this new thing and they could make themselves seem really like they knew you. So, and I haven't had that talk with them yet. It's kind of hard. You have kids you don't want to like freak them out and at the same time you want to freak them out. Um, but I, I deliberately for a long time hadn't named them and I really hadn't put up photos of them. And then I had friends that would see me and they would say, oh, I just saw Danny and you know, his family and they'd name them all off. And it wasn't, they weren't meaning any harm by doing it. I just didn't walk around to all my friends and say, by the way, my personal policy is I don't name my children, right? And so then I kind of realized I can't put that away. So I think as I've thought about these more, I'm perhaps a little more circumspect with some of the stuff that I've done. And at the same time, you can enjoy the engagement you have with people. It is fun to be on Twitter and see what somebody's doing and enjoy what they're doing, even if you're not there because you know them in some way. So, it, Again, I don't have the answers, and my views may change further along as I go. It, it can also be scary, too, when you encounter some people who are very hostile or freaky or scary or stalky, and then you really start thinking, wow. And uh, I think about that even more now because previously I was protected by a big giant ocean because <laughs> uh, I lived in a very small place in Britain, and now I live in a very easily and accessible suburban area. So. Um, I see somebody in the back there, yes? Um, I've actually, I've heard John Mattel say once or twice that we're in 1.0 of search, we're in like the DOS command line version of search. And so that, that seems to me to obviously lead towards version two of search is gonna have a lot more to do with interacting in like the real world or the meat world as Chris called it earlier. Um, and so I'm wondering, since you're talking about how search meets real life, where you think those connection points are gonna be as we go forward? Um. If you do a search for search 3.0 and then search for search 4.0, there are two long articles I did that talk about that kind of evolution. And the search 4.0 thing is probably more to your question, which is the idea that we'll take search and we'll take social data and we'll mix them together and who your friends are and how all your stuff will come together. And that has some real impacts. Most significantly what's happening right now is that Google is actually taking a lot more of where you're going and surfing on the web and changing the results just for you. And you're seeing something much more different than other, other people. Or you may, in some cases, see things different. And they're actually starting to alert you about that now and say, hey, we changed your results in this way. Um, that's going to be a different thing than if we really do get the social sharing where, hey, I'm going to start interacting with your friends and your friends can see what's going to be going on. You have other things to start opening up because we do a lot of very private searches. We tell search engine stuff we don't tell the closest people to us. <laughs> we merrily dump it into a search box, though. Hey, guess what? I'm having a problem with blah. You know? And it's going to be an issue if you really do get somebody who gets a network effect where people really are sharing their searches with their friends, where you're going to have people inevitably forget that, oh, I need to block that search. And I don't want that going out there. And I think that's going to be a problem. But I think that's also one reason why you haven't seen that happen just yet. I also think that, by and large, search, to me, tends not to be a social experience, not to be a buzzkill on it. But um, I think most of the time, when it comes to search, you're not really trying to share with everybody else. Uh, the pipe just broke. The water's coming down through your ceiling. You're not like thinking, hey, I just did the search for plumber, and it's really good, and I want to share it. It's like, I want a plumber right now to fix my pipe. The water's coming down. It's breaking everything. And then you're done, and you move on to the next thing. So, uh, another question? I'm trying to think. I would love a question, too, if somebody in the audience would like to know what everybody else in the audience thinks on this. I mean, I can try to do one of the hands up. I mean, does there anybody kind of agree with the idea that if there's something on Google that you think is, say, personally embarrassing to you, that ought to come down? Anybody like that? Just take it out. Anybody? It's all right. I mean, <laughs> I would love it, right? <laughs> um, but you know, I know it's not going to happen that way. Anybody feel like if there's information that you could show in some way is private, 
that ought to be able to be removed without issue, to be taken out? Anybody kind of feel like it doesn't really matter because even if you take it out, it's still out there? Dan, Danny. Yeah. Okay. Uh, where? Over your front row. Yeah. Here. Um, okay, I, I think the difference is, is that if something's personally embarrassing, but it's fact, I think that's maybe the challenge is that if it happened, it happened. And so, right. you know, you couldn't go to the Seattle Intelligencer and say, you posted, you know, this about me in, in the newspaper and it's embarrassing to me if it's fact. I mean, I think the, the relevant question is, is it true? Is it, you know, something that, you know, gets on the, on, within the issue of, of being libelous or not, something like that, as opposed to, because I think right. maybe the hesitation is, you know, if it happened and it's true, then Although what here, right do we have? Here's an interesting twist on that, because there's an exact example that goes to it. So you did have a newspaper who reported on a contractor who was being sued over alleged fraud or whatever, and it turned out, a contractor or something, but it turned out they didn't do it. But when you would search on the contractor's name, the older page started coming up, saying that the um, saying what it had been charged with, and also because of the way Google does the descriptions, it said so and so has been charged with this, right? So that was your impression. This person was really upset. It's like you're basically libeling me every time somebody does a search for me. They weren't, but you didn't get the whole thing. And so that's where, you know, then if you start thinking about it more, you kind of want to be able to say to Google, you know, somebody searched for this person. The crimes that were alleged against them, if later on uh, were disproven, shouldn't that be the page at least you substitute in? And at that point, it falls apart because Google just starts going, well, we can't do that. It'd work with the algorithm. We never touch anything. We don't know what to do, and blah. Unless it's you know, a Google bomb, and then we'll take care of that. You know, it's, but it, it's a hard thing. Yeah. Um, my, my concern, actually, on the comment that was just made, first is just because it's a fact doesn't mean it must be in the public domain. Um, I have an actual big problem with that as a concept. I think we are putting our lives in a position that humanity's never faced before. And just because Google's out there doesn't mean we all have to say, well, that's the right thing for us to live under. And, and my corollary problem with it is the fact is there that a rumor on the internet is a fact until absolutely disproven. And that's problematic. And, and even the rumor becomes a fact, even if, it's, even if it is disproven, then it remains an issue. There's been a number of people who are really upset over the fact that now they are known because of a scandal or controversy or some issue that came up that may have moved on with it from there. Um, we've got five minutes. We have time for more questions. Waving from the short person from the back of the room. Danny, I'd like to go back to the Google um, Viacom case. Uh, our laws aren't Laws don't happen fast, and the legal system is definitely behind the eight ball, I think, in this particular instance. How do we get, how do we do, uh, get rid of this disconnect so that we, that case does not become a precedent? And I know there are lawyers in the room, they might want to speak to it too. Um, I mean, to some degree, it is a precedent now because Google has acceded to what Viacom wanted. I, I can't tell you how disappointing I was with that. This is the company that, when uh, the U.S. Department of Justice demanded less sensitive records, stood up and said, you know, that's overreaching anyway, and we're not going to give it to you, and we're going to fight you all the way. And when Viacom came along and said they wanted this, um, Google said, well, we hope to work something out. And then they said, this anonymizing stuff will work. And in my opinion, it's not going to work. It doesn't resolve some of the concerns that are out there. They could have said, you know what, if they want to know what people are viewing, we can give them the videos that have been viewed without any associated information that possibly could be linked back to particular users. And that should have been fine. But I got the impression that it was like, well, you know, we're already in this fight. We don't want to carry it forward. And I was like, what's going on? You guys should have, I understand. Because really, nobody feels like Google and Viacom want to go to court. They want to find a settlement. So it's not to their advantage to be really hostile with each other in some respects. And when this, they are in court. but. No, 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 no. So there were a bunch of different things. It, it went to court, but the ruling came back saying, you can have this, but you can't have that. And one of the things the judge said was, yes, you can have the viewing records. You can have the IP addresses associated with each video that was viewed. You can have the cookie data and the username. And the only change that happened since then was they said, all right, anonymize that data. 
change the IP to something else for each person. But it'll happen on a unique basis. So whatever your, if your IP address was always 192.168.01, now it's gonna be like 155.15, you know, whatever. So you can still build up a profile, from my understanding, if you wanted it. So, you know, if, if I, I would have liked to see them thought that further. As a solution, I mean, this probably goes back to what many people have said before. You get these tech things and you, you kind of want like the Supreme Court of Technical Justice to be out there. You kind of want to feel like it is not going to a judge who is going to have to come up to speed on it. When this happened, I called the judge's courtroom uh, and I got a hold of one of their clerks. I was like, you know this ruling that just happened? Like, all the shit's going to hit the fan in like about an hour. And do you guys even know what he's done? And the clerk's like, huh, what? And <laughs> this is beautiful. I'm like trying to explain it to him because I'm like, I'm not expecting the judge to comment on it, but I thought I'll at least try. And I'm trying to explain to the clerk who is far younger and should be far savvier than that. And in the end, he's like, well, could you maybe mail us, like in an envelope, what's going on? And I said, you don't understand, this is gonna be a big, huge story and you're gonna be getting phone calls from all these major newspapers shortly. You know, it's just it's going nuts now. I'm gonna, it's gonna happen. Well, how about I email it to you? Oh, we don't have email at the court that we can use. Wait, what the, this is like 2008? You don't have email at the court? You don't, uh, what? You, and you're deciding a tech case? And you're the clerk working with the judge? Telling him, hey judge, I think you ought to go this way on it. It freaks right. me out. One more question, and then we got lunch. Sure. Well, I think we're bumping up against sort of an existential question over the what's a fact, in that it may well be recorded, some idiot thing that I did 20 years ago, but I'm not that person anymore. So identity can change, and there's sort of no way that we've got to grapple with this thing. It used to be, well, it'll sort of be forgotten in the sands of mm. time, but uh, it's a real mind twister to think, well, how's it gonna capture you know, the, 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 the real me? So well, I'm, but it's a good point, because it may be that it's, it has to be that we're just gonna change ourselves that our notions of privacy or who we are and what was accessible to us will start to change over time. As I'm sure other people have had to go through at other times when there have been technological changes, but we, I personally don't know it because I don't tend to go back and think, well now what did they do when we first had phone books, right? Oh, you mean you can find somebody's phone number? <gasps> That's an invasion, you know. And at some point somebody decided we should have unlifted numbers, obviously, and there'd be other changes like that, so. Um, well, I. I'd like to thank the people I picked on. I hope you guys don't mind that are out there allowing me to, to uh, use you as an example in the presentation. And um, I look forward to any other comments you all might have. Um, that's all our stuff there. The slides will all be up at SlideShare and I'll make them available afterwards. Thanks very much and thank, thank you, you, Chris. Really good job. That was great.